This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, as we continue our conversation with Dana Frank, professor emerita at University of California, Santa Cruz. Her new book, The Long Honduran Night, Resistance, Terror and the United States in the Aftermath of the Coup. I wanted to go back to 2009, um, when uh, there was a coup in Honduras, and the democratically elected leader, um, the Honduran president, Manuel Zelaya, spoke on Democracy Now! about what happened to him. They attacked my house at 5.30 in the morning. A group of at least 200 to 250 armed soldiers with hoods and bulletproof vests and rifles aimed their guns at me, fired shots, used machine guns, kicked down the doors. And just as I was in pajamas, they put me on a plane and flew me to Costa Rica. This all happened in less than 45 minutes. That was Manuel Zelaya. Democracy Now! Uh, followed him back to um, uh, Honduras after he was flown back, but that, that brokered agreement. We flew on the plane with him from Nicaragua uh, to Honduras. But the new regime was put in place, the coup regime. Uh, Porfirio Lobo, whose son has now been um, sentenced to well over 20 years in prison for drug trafficking. And, Dana Frank, I was wondering if you can just talk about this history that went from the Democrats. I mean, Juan, when you interviewed Hillary Clinton when she was running for president, uh, when you were working at the Daily News, you asked her about the coup. She was not pleased. You asked her about her support, the U.S. support for the coup when she was secretary of state. So it went from the Democrats right through to President Trump. And if you can talk about the extent of this support and why you see that linked um, to what we're seeing with the migrants today, as you say, these are refugees from U.S. policy. Well, we don't have a smoking gun that shows the U.S. backed the coup from before it happened. But all the evidence is very clear that the U.S. wanted the coup to stabilize after it took place, that the U.S. recognized the bogus election of November 2019 that brought Porfirio Lobo to power, and that the U.S. has continued to recognize the ongoing coup regime, especially that of Juan Hernando Hernandez, although he has come in, he, he stole, probably took, stole an election, we don't really know, in 2013. He very clearly ran for president last year year um, in violation of the Constitution, which bans re-election, and then he stole the election in November last year. Against Salvador um, Nasrallah. Yeah. You know, against a uh, united opposition, um, which very clearly won. So the U.S. has uh, given—but it's, so it's not just a question of the U.S. supporting the coup itself. I mean, clearly Hillary Clinton is, was responsible for that. But don't forget that Barack Obama was her boss, and he's responsible, too. But it's not just that moment. The U.S. could have supported, recognized Xiomara Castro as Elias wife when she probably run the election in 2013. The U.S. could have um, intervened or not intervened, excuse me, the U.S. could have protested when Juan Orlando, Orlando Hernandez overthrew the Supreme Court in 2012 when he was president of Congress. The U.S. could have protested when he when he um, ran for re-election. And, of course, it could have called for a new, re new election last winter when um, or recognized the outcome of Nasrallah as the winner last winter's elections. The U.S. Gave, has given this post-coup regime green light after green light after green light. So it's not just—and it's not just Obama. It's not just Hillary Clinton. It's also John Kerry and now Donald Trump and, and his secretaries of state, Tillerson, Pompeo, John Bolton at the National Security Council. Um, Mark, Senator Marco Rubio, who is reportedly the person advising Pompeo on U.S. policy in Honduras right now. So this, this is an ongoing policy, and, and uh, the Hondurans will be very quick to tell you that the, uh, Juan Orlando's regime continues because of U.S. support, not just the police and military aid, which is pouring in, but this, this legitimation of the regime. And if you want to see the continuities, the key figure here is—, is General John Kelly, who was the head of the United States Southern Command out of Miami um, before he was uh, chief of staff for Trump. And he very much has supported Juan Orlando Hernandez. He called him a magnificent guy and a good friend. And here's how we can see this continuity from one regime to the next. Uh, you say that there is no smoking gun in terms of the uh, U.S. Uh, involvement, but your book does talk about uh, a, a highly uh, uh, unusual meeting that happened the night before the coup between the, the key general who led the coup uh, and uh, uh, a U.S. official. Yeah, that's Jake Johnson's research for The Intercept. I mean, we have a, U a top U.S. official, the liaison to the military, I think he was, meeting with General Romeo 
Vasquez Velasquez the night before, and then leaving a U.S. embassy party that night and coming back. So that's the best we have that the U.S. knew about it. And, you know, Hillary Clinton says in her autobiography that she was at the pool in Cape Cod, and she was surprised by the phone call. Um, and, you know, and she also famously says, we, we helped them with the election of 2009 make the question of Zelaya's return moot. And that was so outrageous that she said that. She actually took it out of the paperback of Edition of her autobiography. So you have now a situation um, where you have thousands of Hondurans that are fleeing to the U.S. border. Your response to the tear gassing, which we're going to be talking about in our next segment of the migrants, and also uh, Mexico's incoming foreign minister, not the government of Peña Nieto, but the government of AMLO, of Andrés Manuel López Obrador, um, saying um, that the uh, that they have agreed uh, to wait, um, that the migrants should stay waiting on Mexican soil as they wait to hear their appeals, but that in return, the U.S. government should pay at least $20 billion for a Marshall Plan-style program aimed at developing the economies of Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala. Well, two things here. One is that, obviously, the use of the tear gas is terrifying, as is the presence of the U.S. military at the border in violation of the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act. So let's mark that, as well as tear gas fired into a foreign country against people, uh, uh, terrified, starving people trying to seek legal asylum applications in the United States. So this is a terrifying you know, militarized uh, response to these refugees, really, I think, so morally disturbing and also um, uh, illegal use of federal troops here, and that's the Border Patrol shooting it. But, I mean, this is, this is a very terrifying militarization of our own border. And I want to make the parallel of that to the militarization, the U.S. funded militarization within Honduras, because now the Honduran military is also, in, since 2014, with the so-called crisis of undocumented, unaccompanied minors coming to the United States, the Hunter and military actively stops people from leaving their own country. Um, and that, these are U.S.-funded and trained forces that are doing that. And I find this in, uh, armed encirclement terrifying. And, of course, the same tear gas, which is often manufactured in the United States, is used against peaceful protesters and bystanders and hunters for years and years and years. You know, I have this story in the book about a friend of mine saying, in the first couple months after the 2000 coup, he was learning to taste all the different flavors and types of tear gas that were being used against Honduras, Hondurans um, after the coup. And this has just been going on all, all in the last week against the protests on the anniversary of the stolen election. So we, I want to underscore that there's these militarized parallels of what's going on in both countries. And then this question of the $20 billion Marshall Plan. Well, I don't know if people that remember after the so-called crisis unaccompanied children coming to the, to the United States in 2014, the Obama administration's response response was something called the Biden Plan, promoted by Vice President Joe Biden, that wanted to give a, a, a billion dollars to the governments of, of uh, the so-called Northern Triangle, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, in order to stop migration and address root causes. And if you look at that, and it was $750 million of that was eventually funded by Congress, if you look at that, it's pouring precisely into the same security forces and sectors of the economy that are causing people the very repression, the very um, destruction of the economy that people are fleeing. So when you start hearing, I mean, it's, of course, we're all watching to see what López Obrador is going to do in Mexico. But the, uh, and of course, we the, the Honduran economy does need to be rebuilt, but not according to a model run by the, the current U.S. government and run by the repressive regime of Juan Orlando Hernández and the, the Honduran elites. And that's what's so terrifying here is, like, you pour that kind of money in in the same model, and we've, we've been down this road before, and you're just handing money over to the Leafs to steal and use it to, to really terrorize their people over and over again at higher and higher levels. And Dana Frank, one of the uh, uh, most interesting parts of your book is your portrayal of this, uh, e uh, this enormous and widespread popular movement that develops uh, after the coup against Salaya, and uh, you contrast it, and rightfully so, that back in the 80s, Honduras was a relatively quiet place, while El Salvador, Nicaragua and Guatemala were all embroiled 
embroiled in major civil conflicts and, and uh, uprisings and government repression. But yet Honduras, I remember being there in 1990, and it, it was a, a it was then a ter terrorized state. There were military all over the place, but there wasn't the kind of popular movement that somehow developed uh, after the coup against Salaya. Could you talk about that and how it inspired you and, and shaped your, your own thinking of your role as an academic? Yeah, you know, there certainly was um, an active left in Honduras in the 80s, but mu much smaller scale than in the other countries, and, um, and tremendously repressed by some of the figures that are currently popping up again since the coup in Honduras. Um, you know, the Honduran resistance was, a, and still is, and a tremendously beautiful thing that was a great surprise, although, in retrospect, you could see the social movements that were building at the grassroots, and the women's movement, the campesino movement, the indigenous movement, the Afro-indigenous movement and human rights defenders. And when the coup happened, people poured into the streets and formed this tremendous coalition called the National Front of Popular Resistance, known as the Frente or the Resistencia, which was an amazing coalition, not just of the folks I just named, but of the labor movement, the LGBT movement, but also people um, committed to the constitutional rule of law. Not It wasn't about so-called Zelaya supporters, as it was often framed, but people who were committed to a transformation, a positive transformation of Honduras, as well as defending the constitutional rule of law, which is something, of course, resonates differently in the United States today, with Trump threatening the constitutional rule of law um, all over the place. And um, that resistance was a very beautiful thing. And in the first chapter of my book, I wanted to read her to really feel the joy of it, as both the terror and the joy of the creativity, of the music, of the humor, the bravery, the graffiti, and the way it changed Honduran culture for good. And um, and made people proud of their resistance and uh, discovering ties across different social movements in a massive coalition of the kind that we fantasize of in the United States today. Unfortunately, that resistance has been repressed and repressed and repressed. A lot of key figures are now in exile. People have been killed. Journalists that cover it are killed or are in exile. And so it's it's been also terrifying to watch that repression, but also Hondurans have that in their hearts that they know what they can do and how they could feel um, a beautiful sense of solidarity.